be here and, and to have the opportunity to um, share a little bit of my past and recent work on human brain fingerprints. Before I get into that, let me first start by introducing this concept, brain fingerprinting, although I'm pretty sure that most of you are familiar with this idea. One of the first work indeed uh, on the topic was by the seminal paper by Emily Finn and colleagues where they use human connecting project data and the two different days of acquisition that we have in for resting state, for instance, and also for the different tasks, they computed, you know, functional connectum. Since we are in a brain connectivity workshop, I don't, I'm assuming that we're all familiar with functional connectum or functional connectivity matrices. And in the end, they had two connectums per subject. So one connectum per subject in day one and another connectum in day two. And then what, what did, did they do? They do what I explain it as a guess who game. They were picking randomly a connectum from day one and they were trying to guessing to find the best matching similarity with all the other connectums in day two. And what they found was that by doing this like multiple times, many times, they were able to guess right, the right subject solely based on the functional connectums in resting state data with a 95%, above 95% accuracy, accuracy or success rate as they call it. And, and why, why was this uh, important and striking at the time? Well, I think for two reasons. First, <clears throat> because at the time, many people in the community, myself included, we were just doing group average of connectums. If we wanted to compare, for instance, you know, the healthy, connectum versus the clinical Parkinson's connectum, Alzheimer's connectum, and so on. And this was coming at the cost to potentially lose uh, uh, information, in the important individual information. And the second reason, I think, is you could tell that functional connectum is a pretty coarse grain summary of, of a guy's brain activity, and yet there's a fingerprint in this bunch of Pearson correlation scores that allows to identify my brain from yours, a sort of functional QR code, if you will. This concept was interesting. And uh, when I was a postdoc with Wagingoni at Purdue University, I started you know, thinking about, about it. And I wanted to, to find uh, a more fine-grained mitomagal measure of bearing fingerprints. And I think this nicely connects also to, to our previous discussion. And I, I thought, well, but if you are doing the, the similarity all against all, what you are essentially drawing is, is a similarity matrix, which we call at the time identifiability matrix, which encodes the information between the similarity of pairs of connectums across test and retest across day one and day two. And this is basically everything you need to evaluate the level of fingerprint or brain fingerprint in your data. I will give you a few examples. If I, if I point here at this element on the main diagonal, this is the similarity of my connectum in day one versus the, like with, this, with my connectum in day two. So it's a sort of self-similarity or I self as we call it. If I go here over the off diagonal, this is the similarity of my connectum in day two versus Kelly's connectum in day one. So it's how similar we are, how similar I am with the others in general. Just note that this matrix is not symmetric because there's the day one, day two encoding that is, uh, you know, is, is, com is com compromising the symmetry of the matrix. And then what we define as differential identifiability or a more fine grain score of fingerprint in a data set is simply the difference between I self and I others. So the difference within the main diagonal values minus the off diagonal values. This was in the original formulation. Then you can be creative and you know you can v-score this value. You can find more advanced uh, forms for optimization functions. But the gist of it is that you would like to have the main diagonal that stands out as optimally as possible from the off diagonal elements. Another way of using the identifiability matrix is for post hoc quality control on your data set. And I use this example a lot because you see this blue line here. This is a connectum for a subject in day one that is not similar to anybody else's in day, in, in, from day two, sorry, that is not similar to anybody else's in day one. And this is not because the guy is an alien from Mars, but it's just because maybe something went wrong in your functional quantity pipeline and you might want to check that connectum out. And generally speaking, you, in order to play with brain identification, you would like not to be in this scenario on the left where you can see that you cannot distinguish the values along the main diagonal from the values of the off diagonal. 
which is a scenario that you can have if you have low signal to noise ratio in your data or even if you're playing with, with, with multi-site data so you have the same subjects but acquiring different scanners this is what Mia Joaquin called Malkovich scenario because of the fantastic movie being John Malkovich where at some point everybody looks like John Malkovich so this is not good for brain identification you would like to be in a scenario more like this one on the right where you can see a bright nice diagonal and you can play your guessful game uh, safely however if you want to know how to move from the left scenario to the right scenario we have proposed a method, method, methodology to, to actually denoise or maximize fingerprints in brain data. Uh, for interest of time, I'm not gonna go into details, happy to discuss it later. What I would like to focus for the remaining time that I have is on the why. So why is this happening? Why do we have this functional QR code? What, where, are these, um, what, what are these codes originating from? Is it like the cortical topography? Is it because of the functional activities because of of motion. We are still trying to figure all these out. Uh, one question that particularly intrigued me was uh, the temporality of it, the temporality of the process. Specifically, what exactly is the information encoding in brain connectums that ultimately leads to a correct identification? And also, what is the temporal extent needed for brain fingerprints to unfold? And in a recent paper, we try to address this question by using sliding window connectivity analysis and, um, and along two main axes of exploration. The first one was the when. So when is a functional connectum more identifiable? Are there points in time where a functional connectum is more identifiable than others? And the second axis was the how long or the time scale, which was related to the length of the sliding window of connectivity. So how many points do we need to throw into the connectum to actually make it identifiable? Do you need do we need like 20 seconds, 50 seconds, two minutes, 20 minutes? Let's find out. So what, what we found was that playing with different window lengths in our sliding window connectivity analysis, uh, well, we, we, we played also with ridiculously low uh, window length because we wanted the algorithm to fail really. But we already noticed that starting around 100 seconds, you don't need to go as, as far as the maximum acquisition in human connectome project data. This is rest state human connectome project data. But already around 100 seconds, you can have pretty good uh, identification. You can start seeing a pretty good main diagonal. So 100 seconds for human connectome project data might be enough to get a good identification in, in your brain data, which was already something interesting for us. But what was even more interesting was that when we went looking for specific connectivity, edgewise connectivity fingerprint with intraglass correlation. Again, I'm not going into the mathematical details here, but just think that every yellow spot that you see in this matrix is a link, is a functional connectivity link that allows to uh, differentiate subjects from each other, okay? And these links are also ordered by Yale functional networks and subcortical region. This is the Schaefer 400 nodes parcellation, by the way. You can already see as we move towards the different time scales that in the beginning, we have a lot of yellow spots connecting the visual systems with the somatomotor systems. And you can see this clearly also below when we average within the networks. But you can already see that there is this mostly, you know, most also the fingerprint, the links are, are within visual somatomotor and attention networks. And then as time goes by, as you increase, you know, as you slow down the time scale, of the process, you start seeing this square here on the right. So this square is the connectivity within and between frontoparietal and DMM regions, function, functional networks. And in fact, if you were to track the plateau of identification capabilities of each functional network per brain node, and if you were to map this plateau, this peak in fingerprinting across time scales, over a brain renders, that's what you will see. So you will see this nice gradient that transition from very short time scales associated with subcortical regions and somatosensory cortices to slow time scales in fingerprinting where DMN and frontoparietal regions are peaking. And this might be because um, DMN regions and frontoparietal regions might be associated to higher order cognitive functions. And then therefore you need more time points 
to be able to, to elicit an individualized response as opposed to somatosensory supportive region that they have a way, way faster response to, than DMN and, and frontoparietal regions. And in fact, when then we try to match our timescale maps or brain fingerprint with uh, you know, the neurosin database of the different behavioral scores that we have on the neurosin database, we found that at very short time scales, we have association with multisensory processing, visual attention, perception, and so on and so forth. And as we moved along to the right side, so to, to slow over time scales, we started to see higher order cognitive functions. So social cognition, declarative memory, working memory, and so on and so forth. So as usually, I end my talk with more questions than answers. But what can I tell you? Some open answers from, from my quest, my personal quest on brain fingerprints and brain identification. The first thing is that brain fingerprints can be denoised or maximized. However, many factors can contribute to brain fingerprints and not necessarily behaviorally meaningful. So I want to stress this point, right? It's not that you know, everything that is, is, is identifiable is good for your behavioral uh, you know, analysis. And you, you, should also, you, should, you should always assess your sources of confound carefully. For instance, if you have an individualized motion response in your, in your scanner, this might be a fingerprint. You can have some stable response, but you know, it's not necessarily related to behavior. So always carefully assess the, the sources of confound. However, in the case of this, of this study, we reported evidence um, and there is some anti evidence that different parts of connectome fingerprints relate to different time scales. And also that different cognitive functions appear to be meta-analytically implicated in, in dynamic fingerprints across time scales. And with the risk of running a little bit over time, I just want to throw one last slide that might be helpful for the discussion now, which is, okay, many of you might be asking, okay, where do we go from there? So how do we extend this to the, to the clinical domain? How does it work? Well, one we you know, usually in a clinical domain, you usually have the healthy control population and then your, your Parkinson disease population or Alzheimer or stroke. So you can extend the identifiability matrix to include these two groups and you can do two things. Either you work to each identifiability matrix of each group independently, as we did, for instance, in a recent paper by Sarah Stamparki and colleagues, or you can relax or extend this concept of I self, I others that I was telling you about to measure how similar I am as a patient from the control group. So it's a sort of, instead of similarity, it's more like, uh, think of it more like a, a distance metric. So how, how distant I am from the control group. And this is a score that we call iClinical, that it's very simple really, and very flexible because then you can associate it with clinical scores, you can use it for cross-validation and so on and so forth. With that, I conclude. Thanks a lot for listening. These are the references that I touch upon, and I'll uh, be happy to to enjoy the discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Very nice talk. All right, we have a question in the chat from Andrew. Do you know or have a guess of how these time scales of 